Hi from Tony Kinlock in London and Rhys Jones in Melbourne, Australia. The theme of our paper is how to obtain valid fatigue crack growth results for polymer matrix fibre composites so the results may be used with confidence by industry. Now it is some 30 years ago since our ESIS TC4 committee on polymers, composites and adhesives initiated work on this topic. But we still have no ISO standard which has been issued. But we think the latest work by the TC4 committee shows that there is indeed light at the end of the tunnel. This is the common test method which we use to obtain fatigue crack growth rate data on composites. It is the double cantilever beam test for mode one. When we make this test sample, we have a insert here which would give us a blunt crack and therefore we get a sharp crack we then grow or extend this crack length and then we start the test with the extended crack length from which we start measuring the data obviously the sample is loaded in fatigue and we typically measure the rate of crack growth dadn as a function of the energy release rate and then we plot typically log DADN versus the log of the range of the energy release rate. This is the way the data has typically been plotted in the past. The range of the energy release rate is given by this equation. Now we have seen before that when we use this type of plotting routine of log DADN versus log range of G, then we do get results which sometimes give us strange predictions particularly with respect to the effect of an r ratio also and most importantly we have seen that the results we get from such tests can often give a very very wide range of scatter now we think we understand why these problems occur and this is really the theme of the current talk The three major problems arise in firstly, how do we plot the measured data in a valid manner, which is useful for material selection, development, design and lifing studies by industry. Secondly, how do we ensure that the measured fatigue behavior takes into account fiber bridging effects, since fiber bridging tends to develop behind the crack. And that's the crack we use to actually start the test as well as during the test and can give very misleading and optimistic results from the fibre bridging effects. Thirdly, how to determine a valid upper bound curve for the fatigue crack growth rate, which is free from fibre bridging effects and takes into account any other inherent scatter in the measured data. Here is the first challenge. How do we plot the measured data in a valid manner? One could begin by asking, what do the metals community do? Well, the metals community, as we know, use the Paris law. And the Paris law is typically a plot of log DADN against the log of the range of the stress intensity factor, where the range of the stress intensity factor is given by this equation. But for analyzing fatigue results from composites and adhesives, we use an energy release rate approach rather than a stress intensity factor approach since the K approach is invalid for composites and adhesives. So how should we, the composites community, plot our experimental data? To answer this question, the first thing one should notice is the course that K squared equals EG, where E is the modulus and G is the energy release rate. Now work is in the past are often used for composites and adhesives, the term delta G, where for mode one, delta G is given by this equation thinking, of course, it's analogous to the Paris law. But of course, K is proportional to root G. We should not therefore use delta G. Instead, it's been proposed by us and others that for similitude to the Paris law equation, we should actually use delta root G given by this equation. And we will be using the term delta root G in the current work, since we think that gives us similitude the Paris law equation. Here is a second challenge. 
How do we ensure that the measured fatigue tests take into account the fibre bridging effects? Now we think that one of the best ways to take into account fibre bridging in the DCB test is by using the approach suggested by Professor Alder Easton's group at Delft University. Here are the results from Dr. Yeo of that group and he obtained his results as a function of the pre-track length AP minus A naught. So he has done here three replicate tests, varying for each test the value of AP minus A naught. And as you can see, as AP minus A naught, the pre-track starting length varies, you move from left to right. For example, if we look at test one shown here, then for test one at 3.4 millimeters, we get the data shown here. For test one, 11.6, that curve moves to here. And all we've done is to make the length of the uh, pre-crack longer. And the same effect occurs until we get to a test one at 68.1 millimeters when we get to here. So we have gone from left to right by in the plots of DADN versus delta root G simply by varying the pre-crack length AP minus A naught. Of course, as we increase AP minus A naught, this gives rise to an increasing amount of fibre bridging. We think this effect is the reason why previous workers have reported very large scatter in the measured results. That is because the measured DADN versus energy release, release rate relationship is very dependent on the value of the pre-crack length AP minus A naught. Thus, the fatigue test must take into account of the extent of fibre bridging. Now for the third challenge. How do we determine an upper bound value for the fatigue crack growth rate, which is free from fibre bridging effects and also therefore represents a worst case curve and also takes into account inherent scatter that we see in fatigue tests. Our approach to obtaining the upper bound curve, this worst case curve, is to use the Hartmann-Shriver approach. The Hartmann-Shriver approach was introduced in 1970 for metals and expressed in terms of the stress intensity factor and has been widely used by industry. We have, of course, now recast the equation in terms of delta root G. So we have delta root G given here, as previously. We have a delta root G threshold value given here. And the delta root G threshold value is the value below which no crack growth is seen. So we now recast the original Hartmann-Shrive equation as shown here. And as you can see, we have the rate of crack growth, DADN per cycle. We have three constants, D, N, and A. We have the delta root G threshold. And what I will show on the next slide is that by somewhat varying this parameter, we can obtain one linear master relationship for all the different sets of data. And we will use Dr. Yeo's results as an example. We have done this for several other composites. Dr. Yeo has produced 76 sets of data. So it's a really good test of the Hartmann-Shrive approach. This shows the results from using the Hartmann-Shrive equation expressed in terms of delta root G. Here we plot the value of DADN, the fatigue crack growth rate on a log scale, of course, and on the x-axis, we have the log of the main body of the Hartmann-Shrive equation. We show here the results from 76 sets of test data with the initial length, AP minus A naught of the starting crack was varied for any given set of tests. Dr. Yeo studied a number of factors. He looked at the thickness of the um, composite arms he looked at mode one and mode two, but mainly mode one test shown here. He did a number of replicates using different R ratios. And these 76 test data sets can all be fitted to one single master relationship simply by varying somewhat the value 
of delta root threshold. This obviously enables us to get a mean value of delta root threshold and a standard deviation by fitting all the test data sets onto one single master relationship. As I explained, that master linear relationship from the Hartmann-Shrive equation was obtained by varying somewhat the value of delta root G threshold for each test data set. This is the mean value we needed, and here's the associated standard deviation that we needed to give us that one master relationship. Now we may use these values together with value of D, value of N, and the value of GC0. Now GC0 is the initiation quasi-static interlaminar fracture energy at the onset of crack growth, which we may me readily measure. Now to predict the upper bound fatigue crack growth rate curve, which encompasses all the experimental data and may be thought of as a worst case curve, then we can take the Hartmann-Shrive equation, use the values shown in the table, and when we do that, we use the values of GC0 and the values of delta root G threshold. And we take the mean values along with either minus three standard deviations, which the aerospace community defines as an A basis for designing primary structures, or with minus two standard deviations, which the aerospace people define as the B basis for designing secondary structures. Now, of course, you can use as many minus standard deviation values as you wish. The more minus numbers of standard deviations you use, the more conservative you, you, you become. This slide shows the results for the predicted upper bound for T-crack growth rate curves using the Hartmann-Shrive methodology that we've proposed. Here's the rate of T-crack growth. Here is the delta root G value, plotted of course on log log axes. Here's the experimental results from Dr. Yeo. If you recall, he had 76 tests where he varied the length of the starting crack, AP minus A naught. Obviously here, he's got longer values of the starting crack and hence more developed fiber bridging. And these slow, show a slowing or retardation of the fatigue crack growth rate, and therefore very optimistic results. And here he shows data where he has a very short extension of the crack length, therefore very little fiber bridging, and therefore no slowing or retardation of the crack growth fatigue curve. Here is our predicted upper bound curve, worst case curve, which should encompass all the experiment results and indeed you can see this minus two standard deviation base curve does lie to the left of all the experimental data. Here's the other option that we've looked at where we take an A basis mean minus three standard deviation approach and again this upper bound lies to the left of the experimental data. Obviously the more standard deviation values you subtract from the mean the more conservative your choice of lines going to be. To draw some conclusions from the current work, then we believe that experimental tests must consider the effects of fiber bridging. And we also would suggest that the Delft University proposal for varying the length of the pre-crack, AP minus A naught, is an excellent way of doing this. And this of course needs to be coupled with a sufficient number of replicate tests to capture the inherent scatter seen in all fatigue tests. We think the best way to plot the results is against the term delta root G or possibly against root G max. But in both cases, note we use the square root of the energy release rate. A linear mass of representation has been observed when we get all the experimental data are plotted according to the Hartmann-Shrive equation. This captures the effect of R ratio, mode mix, test temperature, etc., and yields a unique master linear relationship which captures all of these effects. The important aspect is that from the master Hartmann-Shrive relationship, we have suggested a methodology to obtain a valid upper bound curve. 
This encompasses all the experimental data and provides a conservative, the T crack growth rate curve representative of the composite. We've shown this for one composite today, but we've done this for three other materials and get the same very good set of results and a very valid upper bound curve in all cases. The upper bound fatigue crack growth rate curve takes account also of the inherent scatter seen with fatigue test. Such a valid upper bound curve can be used for characterization and comparison of composite materials, a no growth design criterion if you wish, or for assessing if a delamination will grow and for design and lifing studies by industry. Finally, thank you all very much for listening and all stay safe.